Have you guys yeah. talked out on this thing yet? No. Um, Oh, this is kind of the last you can be leg honest. of the tour. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I've just been asked that question so many times. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, no. Sorry, no, no. We're just warming up, you know. Yeah. We've got our answers now, so it's up to you guys to give us a question we haven't heard before. You know? yeah. um, um, so what's a question that you wish you had been asked? Uh, well, um, I wish we could have talked more about Ernest goes to jail like we did in the last Yeah, season. we just... We just <laughs> oh, wow. yeah. That was more like we steered it in that direction. We steered, we know? forced it that way. That's where every conversation should go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, why not? I, you know, no, I mean, whatever you guys want. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously very curious in terms of the casting of Dan. I think that's a very inspired <laughs> casting choice. And I was wondering if you thought... We talked about, when you were in uh, South by Southwest, we talked about your next and casting Sharni, and that was also a very inspired... Mm -hmm. Casting choice. So, can you talk a little bit about what what was the impetus that made you want to say this guy can play this character? Well, I mean, it j he just fit perfectly into what that character needed to be, which is uh, somebody that you that you kind of would just naturally trust. You know, Dan has like a a very likable, like just natural, you know, charm to him. So, um, you know, that was kind of what we were like looking for was somebody that uh, it would be believable that in this situation that, that this family would let him into their home. You know, and beyond that, you know, Dan just, you know, he 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 has like a, a like a coolness to him that uh, just kind of fit the character, and, and and he was just ready to do something like this. He got the sense of humor of it, and uh, you know, so it was, it was pretty straightforward. Once I met him, I, I felt pretty comfortable. Like this is the guy for the movie. You know, like. He was one of the first meetings I took on the film, and I met a lot of actors um, in that kind of age bracket. And uh, from the get go, I was like, "This, this is the guy." You know? Well, I imagine when you're screen testing, at some point you say, "Like, okay, now do this dead-eyed steel face." <laughs> well, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I never screen testing. Oh, you never screen tested? Them. No, right. not it's not, nice. not for that. It was just it was just meeting with them, you oh, know, okay. meeting with a lot of actors. And I think if it had gotten down to that point, we would have done it. But like, it, it was clear that uh, he could do it. I mean, the real question is, is like. You know, like, it, you know, something like that makes, you know, maybe like your foreign sales company is a little nervous because, you know, he's, he's, he's not known for doing this thing. So it's not an obvious sell. You know, it was more about like getting beyond those kind of barriers than it was the, you know, because I've already seen him in Downton and I thought he was a great actor. And in his take on the character and his, pers you know, personality was spot on, you know. Um, well, I mean, and that's one of the things too is I feel like, a lot of times when you when you cast actors, you want to cast from their natural personalities. You know, you want to see if they already have a good amount of what you're looking for ingrained in them naturally, and um, and that'll just like come out through the performance. As long as you know they can, you know, hold their own. And, you know, even if it's in a totally different role, I feel like it'll translate. You know. Yeah. Well, um, I gotta say that your next was really badass. <clears throat> this was also badass, and the fact that you said that both of them were in the same universe. Mm -hmm. I want to see the character of Aaron from your next and the guest from this one go at it in the third one. And you can call it the guest is next. <laughs> the next guest. <laughs> uh, so now that you've done two of them, what's the third one, gentlemen? Well, we don't really know what's, what's up next for us. Um, you know, there's, there's another project with the same producers that kind of is almost a continuation of this, like, filmic philosophy, if you will, of, of, of combining a bunch of different genres and crazy ideas um, that, you know, that that's progressing quite nicely, but but we might end up doing, like, a studio project first. We've got, like, three, I'd say we have, like, three films on our plate right now, and it's just a matter of trying to figure out which, what order they're going to go in. Okay. Um, but we don't tend to talk about our films until we're done making them um, for, for a lot of different reasons, but one of the least of which is that, um, you know, I, I find it personally hard to be excited about movies if they've been overhyped to me via, like, social media and whatnot. I, I, too, too often today I'm sick of a movie before I even see it, yeah. uh, or before I even see a trailer for it. <laughs> um, and so, so I kind of want, you know, people to have kind of the opposite response to our films, you know, which is like, you know, they, they, they discover them. Um, you know, when, when they're more ready, um, you know, when it's more easy for them to see them, you know, they don't have to like think like for like two years, like, oh gosh, I really want to see something. <laughs> Though that did happen with your next, but that was a different thing. Yeah. Um, but you know, we premiered, when we premiered your next, I mean, we didn't, that nobody, we hadn't announced that that movie was happening until, uh, it, it had its Toronto premiere announced. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that worked really well for us actually, because, you know, one of the reasons I think Lionsgate was excited is because it kind of came in under their radar. 
Um, and 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 I think we'd like to kind of continue to do that, not just for studios, but for you know for fans. Yeah. It but if we did do your next sequel, I think you crack the code. It's like it's, it's got to be like Alien versus Predator thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they got to go at it. That I mean, would be a, an amazing crossover, wouldn't it? And, uh, <laughs> Joe Swanberg's character from Horrible Way to Die. Somehow he survived. Um, or his character from your next, he just has like a whole bunch of things. Yeah. Stuck. Yeah. yeah <laughs> So the film definitely has kind of an 80s vibe to it, like a nice throwback to some of the, the 80s mm-hmm, genre mm-hmm. films. Um, did y'all know going into it that you wanted to do that, or did it just kind of play out um, as you were making the film? Well, yeah, I mean, that was cooked in from the beginning because, um, you know, uh, you know, rewinding back to the kind of genesis of this whole situation, um, you know, prior to your next, and including your next, um, we always had to, um, you know, to be able to raise money for the films, we always had to kind of pick a specific subgenre that was more or less a safe financial bet for the investors. And um, because, you know, we weren't safe financial bets yet ourselves, you know. Yeah. So the best way to do that was to pick things like serial killer subgenres or um, home invasion, uh, you know, which is what your next was. And, and that's how we got those movies financed. And um, after Your Next was our first success, we were in this new position where we were able to choose our projects differently. And, uh, you know, and, and that, that was actually an interesting kind of learning curve because, you know, we'd been kind of building our careers up to that point, and, but not really necessarily thinking about what happens after you get to that point. Um, you know, it was always about... Yeah, we'd be lucky to even get there, you know. It, it, exactly. would, it would have felt like a jinx almost to plan out. Like, and after we have our, our big... Exactly. So after yeah. we have our big wide release from Lionsgate, then we'll do this. Yeah, you always <laughs> just kind of assume that that'll just work itself out, you, you know. know? Um, but uh, once we were there, you know, it took a little bit of figuring out what we wanted to do as filmmakers, not just as, you know, essentially like f- film film beggars, you know what I mean? And... Um, and so uh, it, it all kind of culminated, though, with, um, you know, one day I was at the, the Snoot offices, that's the production company that did Your Next, and, um, and I just had a stack of Blu-rays with me, and I just happened to put on the, uh, the original Halloween and the original Terminator. And, um, and when I watched that, I just realized that those movies really encapsulated, you know, the reason I wanted to become a filmmaker in the first place. And so I called Simon up, and I kind of pitched him this insane cyborg idea, and um, and but it turned out that um, that idea in itself, you know, kind of fit in a weird way with an older idea you had. Yeah, it just kind of fused kind of nicely with this uh, drama that I'd kind of tried to write back in two thousand seven, um, and, and abandoned because it just I didn't feel like it was working, and I didn't feel like it was also a film I could get made. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of speaking to what Adam was talking about, where at that point in in you know both of our careers, it wasn't like people were throwing money at us. Um, so it didn't feel like this was worth my time, um, but but it was. A, but I liked it. I liked the dynamic of like, you know, the mysterious kind of like soldier showing up and claiming to have known the family's dead son, and I liked kind of where those initial pages had gone. Um, I just could never kind of find the right tone to approach it with. It it it, it kept going like too much towards like somber, if that makes sense, or self serious. Um, and I didn't want to appear like I was commenting, you know, on like a military experience that I myself hadn't had, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so it was really when Adam kind of talked about making, uh, you know, we both kind of, uh, you know, we're both in our thirties. I'm, I'm, I'm quite a bit older than Adam, but still in, in the same, you know, decade. Uh, so we, you know, we, um, you know, we, we kind of, you know, the movies that we were most aware of, you know, at, at the time that we became conscious enough to love films, it was the eighties. And, you know, the films that we really imprinted on were those eighties genre films. So, so I realized that that kind of approach to that subject matter, was a really kind of successful fusion. And, and then after that point, the script actually was able to come out fairly quickly, considering that I unfortunately had to work on a few other projects at the time, mm-hmm. which aren't happening. Yeah, so strangely the, <laughs> strangely the stylization, you know, that I brought to Simon um, fused well with his script, and then it all became one thing. So, And that, that kind of is a good example of the way we work, where, you know, I let Simon, you know, you know, be the writer. I don't like try to get involved in that process, you know, because Simon is going to come up with 
better characters in story. As I said, I uh, as Adam's elder, he really looks up to me a lot <laughs> <laughs> for like life advice and things like that. And he's kind of like the son I never had. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, I'm just like Simon. Could you uh, throw in some Halloween shit so I can film that? Because I love the way Halloween decorations. And also, here's this goth song. Do you think? Are you, yeah, writing, <laughs> are you writing a script that I can put this goth song exactly. in? And I'm like, oh, I guess I better. Yeah. Uh, no, but I mean, it, you know, it is. Uh, you know, it's funny. This was actually one of the first films. Um, you know, especially the music, because. Uh, I would say that not a single song that's in the film uh, was a song that I'd heard before, mm -hmm. which is unusual. I mean, we're both like really kind of obsessive about music and have huge music collections, um, but but uh, you know, I, I just didn't have that kind of uh, knowledge overlap of like early kind of electronic goth stuff, um, that which Adam was super aware of. So so it was kind of him sending me the music, uh, really guided my creative process in terms of finding that tone. You know, just like being able to kind of listen to those tracks, and I think. Um, I, we've kind of continued to work that way on, on future scripts, you know, it's it's more like, you know, when I'm writing, Adam will kind of send me a song, um, and I'll be like, oh, yeah, 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 this is perfect, but, you know, but also Adam, Adam really does, you know, like, he just knows a ton about bands that are out there in the world, so I discover a lot of uh, kind of music that I like through him. Um, Thank you. Uh, just a small that, that answer went all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> that answer, like, like, spiraled into, like, something else. The, the music, like, really reminded me of Drive. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't... See a lot of horror thriller mm -hmm. films, but that uh, evoked drive to me. How do you guys kind of make your films original? Because I feel like the horror genre, especially not that this is strictly horror, I mm -hmm. thought of more of it as a thriller. How do you keep it interesting and unique? Well, I'll give one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, like uh, for us, it's 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 not about avoiding the the, the pratfalls and all the the tropes necessarily within these genres. It's almost more like embracing them and trying to um, put them in new context, you know. And going back to Drive, that's a great example because, you know, I remember when I saw that film, I, I was really thrilled by it because it was the first time that I had seen a mainstream movie that was able to utilize that 80s electronic aesthetic, even though all that music in that film is modern, but it all had that retro, yeah. on-the-nose, 80s kind of feel. Um, and and, and that, that was almost like the... Um, it, 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 it wasn't something I was necessarily you know, um, drawing on when we were filming the movie, but it was like sort of the catalyst of being like, this is something that people are ready for, mm -hmm. to be able to go back to this, um, and, and, and it can be a mainstream thing, you know? Because if we were just doing some fringe, like, you know, wank off, like, 80s, like, um, you know, retro fest, you know, I, I wouldn't be interested. But if it's a, something that we could bring to your average audience member and your, you know, horror fanatic or genre fanatic of all types, you know, that was something that was more interesting to me. And Drive was the kind of starting point um, for that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, and in terms of writing, I mean, I just, I just really try to write things I haven't seen before. Okay. Um, and I try to watch also a lot of movies. I would say I, would say I probably watch more films than Adam. Um, uh, and certainly, like, when we're, whenever we're at a f film festival, I, I, I really... Uh, force myself to watch a bunch of garbage, um, and, but but there's a reason for that, which is that I you know I don't think I think as as at least at least you know the way that I approach uh, kind of filmmaking or, or screenwriting is is you know uh, I feel like if I don't know what's happening on the vanguard or outer outer edges of cinema, then I don't know how to be innovative uh, with my own stuff, you know. And and to me, it's just you know I never would want to imitate something that I'd seen before. It's more like taking inspiration from it and then trying to do something new with it. Um, I, I would just say, you know, like in terms of how do we be original, I would just say it's that. It's just that we try to be original. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and it's a conscious choice. It's a conscious choice to make movies that, uh, that don't overtly resemble other films uh, and that aren't following like an obvious trend. Um, we have time for one more question. Okay, right. that's perfect. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm the last one. <laughs> um, I'm heavily obsessed with martial arts stuff. Oh, great. So anytime I see any kind of action, anything like that, mm -hmm. First thing I started looking at is how realistic does it look, how accurate. What, is, what was y'all's approach to create kind of the style of his fighting? Well, well, luckily Simon does a lot of martial arts, and he's a teacher. Do you want to talk Which a little more to that? You know? uh, well, you know, well, I should say, first of all, that, that uh, a gentleman who resides in Dallas by the name of Clayton Barber uh, worked with us on Your Next and The Guest, and mm -hmm. he, he's kind of our action stunt choreographer. Uh, and, and he really, he worked not only training both, both Sharni uh, for your next and Dan for this film, but he, he really worked with Adam and, and me, you know, to take what was kind of on the page and make it work in film. You know, there's certain things that are, you know, entirely original to Clayton, like when he dodges the punch and uppercuts that's the guy. Him. Yeah, and, and he, but, you know, but, uh, but I, um, you know, but I mean, it, it, that would work. He, and Clayton actually has coached uh, 
the U.S. Olympic Taekwondo team. Awesome. Um, he's, he's, he's quite a good martial artist. I mean, Taekwondo, it, you know, whatever your opinion on that is, uh, you know, some people kind of think that that's more of a, like, I have a, a kicking drill. I teach it oh, too, so. Oh, okay, well, there you <laughs> go. I'm pretty yeah, insulted, yeah. but I'm ready. No, no, no. <laughs> no, well, Clayton, is, I mean, there's, there's some people that can really make it work, and, right. and Clayton is one of them. I mean, and, you know, and, like, uh, I do have I do have a couple black belt degrees myself. Awesome. Um, not in Taekwondo, though. I did train in it at a young age. Um, but uh, but but you know we're able to speak that language kind of fluently. Cool. Well, and the way that Simon writes too is that the the action scenes are very well ingrained in the writing. It's not like, and you know, because I've read like some some writers are just like, and then there's a there's an action scene. You know, it, it, it's never like that. It's like Simon always hits all the beats, and then when we actually get the location, yeah, then we change. usually have to augment it to fit the location, especially, maybe not so much necessarily the, the, the hand-to-hand stuff, but usually more like the, the big shootout stuff right. in the film. It's like, oh, well, this room doesn't actually connect with this room, and so yeah. we have to figure out a this different way. This house doesn't have a second floor. Yeah. And that's always an interesting process of trying to um, figure out the architecture of, uh, of, of um, you know, fight choreography within the confines of not what what was necessarily written, but what you end up with, you know. <laughs> but you know, Adam and I kind of initially bonded over our love of Hong Kong cinema, um, you know, John Woo's movies in, in particular. And, and I think you know, you watch a lot of American films, uh, and and some of the fight scenes are so just boring, um, you know, because they're they're either so like fake or you right. know, and and you can just tell. And and the fact that we you know we we kind of grew up watching you know instead of that sort you know that sort of thing, we watched you know Jackie Chan obviously a bunch and. and 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 really great fight scenes that have that real physical kind of like like unpredictability to them, um, you know. And I think I think that's just our aesthetic. I, I tend to be very bored by big Hollywood action scenes because it just yeah. feels like everyone's invincible. Um, whereas I love those you know those Hong Kong movies where it just feels like everyone takes damage. So working with Dan, you know, we just made sure that that was. Ooh. <laughs> a big part of it. Well, we always make a joke that, like, at the end of both of our films that we've done that have like a major action uh, star of the or who's the centerpiece of the film, that at the end of the movie they're always limping, you know, they're always <laughs> taking damage, you know. And I've always loved that aesthetic in movies when the hero is just, you know, they're really fucked up by the end. You know? Well, <laughs> but I mean, but, but we're not going to settle for something that looks fake, you know. And, and Dan happens to be very physically adept, uh, you know, just as an actor, and, and and you know, he was able to get really fast and good. Um, but you know, but it, but it, we, but we wouldn't have like, you know, we wouldn't have moved on <laughs> if it wasn't looking right. You know, right. It, it, it's 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 just about you know kind of just having that that aesthetic ourselves. You know, um, and you know, and we're friends obviously uh, with Gareth who does like the raid films and stuff, and he kind of. Mm-hmm. You know, he kind of raised the bar. I feel like a little bit with those films too. Definitely. So we're, we're, you know, we were Just at the a little bit. yeah. It's, like, <laughs> it's kind of one of those things where you're like, well, you know, like we'll take a different approach to action because you don't want to fuck with that raid style. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, also, you, can't do you that don't have 130 days to shoot a movie. Yeah.